a consultant. I work in systems integration and software development and stuff here in Melbourne. Um, when I'm very, very lucky, I get to do that in Python. When I'm less lucky, I get to do it in other languages. But um, for fun, I've been playing around with uh, a lot of um, ESP8266 stuff um, and trying to get a feel for this this side of things. It's It's a nice change from dealing with enterprise systems and SAP and Java and other things that no one really wants to do. It's a lot of fun to actually go and play with a, a chip the size of your thumbnail for a little bit. So this talk is about two things. It's about ESP8266 um, and it's about MicroPython and about running one on the other. All right, uh, who here has heard of these ESP things before this morning? Heaps of people, wow. There was a very similar question at a uh, session at OSDC last year or something and about three people put their hands up and I wasn't one of them. Um, I heard about these chips and went, wow, that is amazing. What are they? They're a, a system on a chip. As Damien mentioned, they're um, out of Shanghai uh, by a company called Espressive and on the inside there are Tensilica core and a bunch of Wi-Fi stuff. A bunch of, I think they're Russians, called Zeptobars decapped one and dissolved its packaging in acid and then took a photo with a very good microscope and that's what the dye looks like. The giant parking lot on the bottom right hand there is the onboard RAM. All the funny little stuff that looks like a petrol refinery or something is the CPU pretty much. And those giant things that look like enormous coils up in the top left really are enormous coils. The Wi-Fi is right there on the chip, on the die. It's actually kind of crazily beautiful if you look at it closely, the way that they've constructed these antennas and, and parts right there in the silicon. It makes it a, a really nice platform to work with because it is so integrated, it's all in one place. They first came to prominence as a Wi-Fi um, controller, so an extra component you might add to something that ran on an AVR or something like that. Neat little unit, eight little tiny pins, you plug it in, you can talk like a, does everyone remember Hayes AT command sets for modems? You talk them to it and send packets back and forth and, and so on. Eventually someone took a closer look at it and realised that it's several times as powerful as the AVR that it was helping. Um, if you have a look at the spec sheet, it runs a lot faster. And that this was a little ludicrous and so people started looking into this as a development platform in its own right. Um, and it has proven to be a very good platform. A lot of people put a lot of work into that and I think uh, the open source world and Espressif both deserve a lot of credit for working well, playing nicely with each other. Um, it's it's a bit of a new frontier for Espressif, I think, and it's a bit of a new frontier for open source to be dealing so directly with Chinese manufacturers, um, and the results have been fantastic. Um, so in short, it's a 32-bit um, core. There's only one of them. It can run at 80 megahertz, or if you like wasting batteries, it can run at 160 megahertz and wait for its um, RAM the whole time instead, or wait for its flash the whole time instead. Um, there's only about 160K of RAM uh, on board of various types. It's very, very limiting, uh, and normally it's coupled with a, about a four megabyte flash, um, which is where all the actual kind of software happens. Espressive's um, system manages to control that uh, quite well, stuff pages in and out without too much intervention from from the programmer. You normally wouldn't buy the actual chip. For a start, you'd keep losing the things, they're very small. Uh, instead, you'd probably buy a little module like this. This is an ESP12 module. Um, there are a whole range of them, imaginatively numbered from ESP01 through to ESP12, and there might be a 13 out by now, who knows? Um, they vary in basically the number of pins they have, the size of the memory that's typically put on them, things like that. But uh, they're all basically the same components. An ESP8266 processor, some flash of varying size and try not to get burnt by that one on eBay. Um, and often they'll come with a little can over the top and generally a little uh, built-in antenna, which is the gold squiggly thing on the left. 
It's a very small package. Um, that's only uh, just under an inch long. Um, very easy to use. There are even smaller packages out there. If you happen to have better eyesight than me, you could even use one. All that's not all that new. It's a, a processor, a system on a chip, etc., etc. Lots of people have been doing that for a few years now. Um, none of that's all that new. What's really new is that they can suddenly you can buy them quantity one for five bucks on eBay. That's only a minor detail, really. But it changes the game a lot for hobbyists, for beginners, for people who might not want to blow a hundred bucks on a prototyping board. If you're a big company, it's it's really nothing. You buy a dev kit, it costs you a thousand dollars. It's not really a big deal. For a hobbyist, that pretty much writes you out getting started, and you've got to make a you know, pretty big decision if that's something you really want to get into. Being able to buy one of these things for five bucks on eBay changes that game completely. It means that you can use them in any crappy project that you happen to have a sudden whim to do. And if that is a robot that picks up tennis balls, you can do that. And if it's made out of parts you found in the junk box and a piece of plank, that's fine. And if you then fry the microcontroller, because there's basically, well, I don't think those bypass caps worked on that motor. Um, if you then fry the microcontroller, it's five bucks and no one has to get upset. Um, and that's really good. Um, and so you can make lots of fun projects and, and play a lot more. It makes it for a lot more playful a pl a platform. All right, how do you actually program these things? The, the worst part about any of these, these little systems is always you, your, your exciting package arrives in the mail for zero dollars postage from Shenzhen or wherever, and you open it up and you look at this thing and you go, right, so I need about 10 times as much in components to wire this thing up as I spent on the actual CPU. That's slightly perverse. Um, in this case, it's a lot easier. These things talk a, a really nice um, serial interface. They have basically a couple of dedicated serial lines that talk a, a RS-232 TTL equivalent. Uh, if you have a decent sized junk box worth of previous generations of CPU stuff, you probably have several of these things. They do need 3.3 volts, by which they don't mean 3.6 volts, and they certainly don't mean 3.7 volts. And if you try 3.8 volts, it gets nasty quick. Um, uh, and they need it at probably a 200, 250 milliamps, or you will get unpredictable results. Um, uh, the old unspecified behaviour uh, tends to happen if you if the power lines dip as you program the things. That's easy to get caught out on because a lot of the 5 volt to 3.3 volt converters you might have in the junk box tend to crap out at 100 milliamps. The things draw a lot less than that in the long term, but in the short term they draw lots of little spikes of power as the Wi-Fi chips turn on and off and things like that. So that's just something to watch. Um, it's it's it, an extremely depressing way to get started on a microcontroller when whenever you go to flash anything, it fails and it sometimes maybe. The easy way, if you really don't want to deal with that stuff at all, uh, and Damien had one of these hanging off the side of his laptop, is to buy a Node MCU. That's really just an ESP12 module. You can see the ESP12 module on the end of it. Uh, soldered onto a um, little backing board there with 10th-inch uh, headers, which are like what's used in standard breadboards that you might have lying around. And on board is a... 3.3 volt converter, which is handy, and a USB to UART converter. So that's really handy too. That's all wired up for you. There's also a couple of tricky little transistors that mean the thing can automatically reset itself, put it itself into flash mode, all of that sort of stuff. You can get them for about 10 bucks, which, you know, maybe have one less coffee and buy the 10 duck buck thing. And then if you, if you feel like you've mastered that, then move on to buying the ones you can get for less than five bucks. <laughs> The, um, it's a very handy little piece of hardware. Originally, it was kind of marketed as a way to run Lua, uh, again, as Damien mentioned, but there's nothing actually locking that particular chip or that particular module onto that particular language or anything. It's really just an ESP8266. The one time that module gets annoying is if you actually want to use the UART for yourself um, because it's kind of tied up directly to the USB port. 
So they're very, very handy little units. You, of course, also need some software. Um, you need to somehow push code on to the chip. You need to tell it, go reset yourself, put yourself into flash mode, etc. There's a handy little lump of Python called ESP tool that does that. Um, and really all you need to do is grab it from GitHub and run it and it will put binaries straight onto the device for you. Uh, MicroPython is now available as a binary that you can just download. Um, so you can skip the following steps if your interest is purely into, into MicroPython and not, say, into using MicroPython as opposed to working on it or changing it or uh, writing new parts of it and stuff like that. You can just grab the MicroPython binary, download it onto the chip. But if you are interested in taking the, the covers off MicroPython a bit, you'll need to get a few more things. There's a, a ESP Open SDK. That's a bunch of C libraries and utilities and so on and so forth that uh, provide a software development kit for the ESP. Espresso themselves put out their own SDK, but it has more um, closed source parts. This particular version, um, which is, again, on GitHub, uh, has as much as possible open source components with only a few little lumps of, of binary blob from Espresso that are still required. So it's probably not uh, going to be Richard Stallman approved, but it's certainly heading towards open source in its, in its intent. Um, that's fun to build. It's an entire GCC tool chain. So you download uh, an awful lot of Debian packages and then you run make and then you go make a nice cup of tea because on my laptop it took at least half an hour to actually build the thing. Um, when you get back though, you've got a cross-platform compiler um, which can compile code into the um, Tensilica um, machine code. And it's just like GCC. You can use all the things you know about GCC, if you know things about GCC. Uh, it's just a regular replacement for GCC. The SDK also includes support for that cool Wi-Fi chipset stuff and a surprisingly good library of things that do things like, you know, uh, perform WPS. And um, there's, it's very simple to put the thing into a mode where it is both an access point and a, a client, both at once, which is kind of nifty. And I didn't realise you were actually allowed to do that for according to protocol, but apparently you are, so that's good. Um, so it can sit there and be an access point and a client both at once and just see how people want to connect to it. There is no operating system though, and this can be a little bit weird for those of us who've worked in larger systems or, or are used to the web world and all that. There is no operating system underneath. So there's no Nginx to dispatch to your processes. There's no... Well, there is a file system, but it's very small. There's no other processes running there. There's certainly not a database. Um, and that can be a little weird. Um, there is a library called libeshttpd. Surprise, surprise, it's on GitHub, um, which provides a pretty good set of primitives for dealing with HTTP and dealing with web sockets and things like that. Um, and it's quite easy to write a bit of C that actually picks up on an, a hardware interrupt so just as a little example of what C code can look like, I don't know, probably can't read that all that well down the back, but that's basically a, a, a little HTTP handler, the code you require to open a socket, listen for HTTP incoming connections, allow people to switch up to web sockets and so on. And you just have to write your own details in there to um, actually make it do something useful. However, writing C is not everyone's cup of tea, especially when you're trying to debug it on a platform that doesn't really have good debugging support at this point. Um, I ended up writing a, a bunch of code on in C and it all went quite well until the end of that first little rush through the code where you, you're feeling really good about everything and everything's flowing well and then you go away and you come back three weeks later and you go, what on earth is this? I don't even know who wrote this. It's got my name all over it. Git blame says it was me. Um, 
but I don't remember anything. So it, it's actually, I, I found it very difficult to come back to and then change stuff. Um, and so I had a look around at the other languages that are available for the platform. Um, Node Lua is the obvious one. It, it came very early on to the platform and it's quite cool. Uh, Lua is just slightly terrifyingly close to JavaScript and Python and therefore I find extraordinarily difficult to get my head around precisely where it isn't JavaScript and it isn't Python, but it's it's not a bad little language with some technical drawbacks. There's some JavaScripts available, um, but I've written far too much JavaScript in my life. Um, there's fourth, that's cool. There's Lisp, that's very cool. And there's basic, so if you really feel like going back to the, the, the great 10 print hello, 20 go to 10 days of programming, you can, you know, which I think is fantastic. Um, I mean, we're talking about a chip here that is this big and is many times as powerful as the Apple II that you may have learned basic on. So I think that's cool. Thanks to this Kickstarter campaign and to Damien, we now have MicroPython. And yay, <laughs> woo! For those of us who are uh, Python fans, this is a great thing. Um, if you like to think in Python, and you like to write Python, and you like to have code that you can come back to three weeks later and actually remember how it worked, um, this is a great thing. MicroPython's pretty easy to build. Like I say, you can just download it as a, a binary now, but if you need to build it, it's right there in GitHub again. You can build it and make it relatively simply. Um, oh, by the way, all these slides will be available. They're all online, so if you want to read the instructions again later, I'll make sure there's a URL to that at the end. Um, you can just build MicroPython. As soon as you write that onto the chip with the ESP tool, as Damien showed you, you can just connect straight to that device and see a REPL, and I, I still am blown away by how magical that seems. Um, being able to connect to this thing the size of your thumbnail and actually say, oh wow, it's Python. I can type dir, I can type help, I can compile uh, Python in Python. It's very, very complete. Um, I kept looking at the, um, the implementation going, oh, but surely at some point I'll find something I can't do and I'll go, oh, this isn't really Python, this is a farce. Uh, but every time I went to do something, it just worked. Um, IO, as, as Damien mentioned, is very, very simple. Uh, you can just type this stuff at the REPL if you want, and this has got to be the quickest platform I've ever seen to get blinking LEDs up on. Um, not admittedly terribly useful in of itself, but there are 16 IO lines. I think 15 of them can do PWM. Uh, there's one analog input. None of this stuff is greatly luxurious if you're used to like an AVR platform or something like this. It's relatively small number of I.O. lines, but it's a good start. You can make a really good start on a servo-driven robot or something like that just by soldering things directly to the pins because the PWM is good enough to drive, say, servo motors. Um, so that's pretty simple. The Wi-Fi, again, as Damien mentioned, is very, very simple to set up. There's a bunch of, of libraries wrapping it in Python. So you can very easily connect up to Wi-Fi and there's the equivalent to B and AP so people can connect to you. Um, sockets, again, about as simple as you can get. And there is actually, a, I haven't got a slide for it, there is actually a, a web server project someone set up um, which uh, is like a micro web server. You're not going to be running Django on this thing. If you wanted to run Django on this thing, that's two rooms over, maybe get a bigger computer though. Um, you're not going to be running Django on this thing, but you, you probably do want to look at it as a web server. Um, it's actually really handy to be able to just serve up your application as a web application straight from the device because many people have phones, things like that. You can just point the phone straight at the thing, load it as a web page, and then it can do a web sockets or an HTTP post or whatever to control what the hardware is doing. Um, I find that a really nice approach. How do you actually get software on there? I mean, it's not an Apple II, so we don't have to type in the listing every time. Um, the REPL is cool, but it's a little limiting after a while. There are a few ways. One of them is to plonk stuff into this uh, build directory, modules build directory, in which case it gets bytecode 
compiled and then frozen into the the firmware you upload to the device. Or you can put it in the scripts directory where it gets frozen into the firmware as source code and uploaded to the device. But both of those things are a little annoying, especially if you don't want to wear out your flash memory too quickly. Um, so the alternatives are to use either there's a thing called WebREPL, which is a, a TCP uh, or a WebSocket, sorry, speaking uh, version of the REPL so that you can talk to the REPL over, over Wi-Fi. Or I've got a little utilities programs collection there that I'm starting on, which is basically just a, a bunch of... Uh, ways you can talk to the thing over that serial line. So uh, I get, this is actually inspired by Lua tool, which comes with Node Lua. It connects up and types for you into the REPL, open this file, write to this file, write this text. And thankfully, due to Python's wrapper function, that's really, really simple to, to implement. So it lets you upload files and soon to come, download files, sync files, all that sort of stuff. So that's a handy way to get stuff on there. Once files are on there, once you reset the device, it'll look for a file called boot.py and run that. Um, so that's very simple to get into. Thankfully, there is also pip. So micro pip provides most of the things you were thinking of from pip so that you can do package management properly and things like that. We really don't want to go back to the good old days of copying package files around and having your own version of everything and, and, and all that or even go to git submodules. I mean, it, it's an approach, but it's it's an annoying approach to have to take. So micro pip is there and it, it seems to work fairly well. As Damien mentioned as well, the not all packages will work with micro Python. Um, the biggest constraint I think is probably this amount of RAM you have available, not much. Uh, a lot of code is optimized very heavily these days to use as much RAM as possible, as often as possible. If you're sitting down to write something and you want it to go fast, mostly what you do in a big CPU is you pull everything into RAM first, right? Oh, cache everything. If you've got a file, oh yeah, it's a giga file. Oh, load it into RAM. Why not? I might have to serve it up several times. That'll be quicker in the long run, right? This thing's got 32 gig of RAM on it. It's fine. This thing doesn't. So uh, you probably don't want to do that. And a lot of libraries make this assumption. I should cache things. I should do that without ever kind of checking how much RAM is actually available. So that's a bit of a challenge, but the the micro Python packages should hopefully uh, make up for that by basically having the same code with a, um, a more memory conserving bent, accepting that it'll go a little slower. It's an 80 megahertz microcontroller, but it will work. Um, the other way I didn't mention in that previous list was actually to, to write your own uh, modules. And I was actually very pleased to see looking around in the MicroPython source code, there's a whole bunch of C files looking suspicious and called things like, you know, mod sys and mod machine and things like that that correspond to the things you can import. And I was very pleased to see that they're actually fairly understandable C code. Um, and so that's worth considering if you've got a, a need on this if you've got a desire to run Python on this chip, but a need to do stuff that has to run quick, it's worth thinking about whether you can make the bit that has to run quick as a C library, as a mod something in MicroPython. And of course, it's worth considering whether you should be releasing that on MicroPython's package management. What doesn't it come with? It doesn't come with an operating system, as I mentioned before. That means there's a lot of things you just don't have. It doesn't have multiprocessing. So if you're used to the idea that your code has to run in a very linear way and that you'll fork off a, a thread or a process or a whatever to handle your web request, uh, you've got a bit of a nasty surprise in store. Um, but that being said, it does do co-routines. Uh, there is a uAsync. Uh, so as long as you're willing to deal with the fact that your code will run asynchronously and in multiple threads, that's okay. There's not much memory to play with, as I mentioned. What I think the biggest thing it's missing at the moment is a way to remotely connect up a PDB or equivalent for a remote debugger. Um, you can debug on it doing lots of, of um, print statements. Sorry, print functions. It's Python 3. Um, print functions and uh, lots of stack traces and so on and so forth. And that's 
fine, but it's not somewhere I enjoy going. So I'd love to see and, and we'll hopefully get to contribute to a, a Python debugger uh, attachment port, basically. All right, uh, I've got a couple of minutes. I just wanted to mention a little hobby horse project. This is what got me excited about ESP 8266s in the first place, is uh, um, educational programming purposes for them. They're very, very cheap. They're very, very simple. They're a great platform for um, teaching programming on. So I was playing around with this idea of how do you teach programming. And one of the things I'd thought about was getting rid of variables entirely, because I found my kids had a lot of trouble getting their heads around variables. Um, and I started looking at data flow architectures, which don't really have variables, they're just data flows from place to place. And I started looking at having a graphical programming language for that and so on. I've ended up implementing this on the ESP8266, and I implemented it the first time around in C, and then I discovered that was far too much like hard work, and I wasn't really doing this for hard work, so I re-implemented it in MicroPython in a couple of days. And what it does is it offers you up first a web page, which has a whole bunch of JavaScript in it, and lets you manipulate these things on the screen. And then what it does is it compiles that down to Python. And one of the things that MicroPython does include is the compile function from Python. So rather than run a virtual machine or anything like that, which is what I had to do in C, it just takes this program that you've written by connecting the bo boxes with lines, turns it into Python, compiles that Python, and runs it in Python on a microcontroller. And I just think that's fantastic that you can actually get away with doing that on such a tiny, tiny platform. You can get away with having that kind of meta-programming approach, and it just works. Um, the, the end result is that the code base is incredibly simple, and my favourite thing about it is it means that if you kind of grow out of playing around with the toy graphical programming language, there's a very, very direct route to go from there to actually programming real Python. You can take the thing you drew in this little sketch, hey, it's a Python program, I can just run it directly instead. So that's just an example of, of, I guess, what I've been working with on this platform. All right, in summary, if you're interested in microcontrollers, Internet of Things, robotics, anything in those general directions, well, ESP8266 is currently about the cheapest way you can possibly get into that. And if you're interested in that stuff, MicroPython has got to be about the easiest way you can get into that stuff. So I think they go fantastically together. All right.